Okay, uh, welcome everyone to our English 235 lecture. I hope everyone is staying safe in this sort of winter wonderland that nature has gifted us. Uh, okay, so today, as you can see here, we're going to continue to excavate the landscape of Brian Turner's collection of poetry, Here Bullet, uh, especially how it was able to adhere to the tradition of the subgenre called, appropriately enough, war poetry. So war poetry, as we touched on in our last lecture, moves in a number of ways, uh, most notably of these ways would be the idea of being a poet crafting poetry of witness. And just to recap, poetry of witness encompasses the idea that throughout history, some poets had felt a moral or even ethical uh, imperative to bear witness uh, in their poetry to events such as war, as we see here, genocide, uh, racism, uh, corporate greed, uh, dictatorial tyranny, and other acts of injustice. So as you can see, these poets and poems of witness are attempting to take past events and experiences all with capital letters, right? So war with capital letter, these genocide with a capital letter G, and, and cast them into the written artistic form in order to foreground some level of concern and even scrutiny. Uh, we see many examples of that very concept throughout this lecture today uh, by us comparing and contrasting past war poets and their work to each other. Uh, we also are gonna take a closer look at the literary theory of postmodernism, which outlines, as you remember, the poets utilization of intertextuality, uh, something we defined last class as the artist borrowing from a past artifact that already has built in meaning and placing that artifact in the artist's work in order to infuse greater, more layered meaning in the present work. So we're gonna see Brian Turner uh, using intertextuality, the borrowing from some past artifact. He's gonna infuse it, something from the past, in this case, written, uh, and then infuse it into his poetry in order to bring that meaning from the past and, and thrust it uh, forward and, and give layer greater meaning into his own work. So this postmodern layering is what, if you recall, the poet Charles Wright uh, called the application of accretion. And accretion is this methodical layering that artists used in order to infuse uh, greater ideas and concepts within their own work. Okay, let's address a bit of housekeeping before we dive uh, head on into this lecture. So today's November 10th. Uh, and we have should have posted by midnight tonight our short essay number three uh, to Blackboard. Uh, so be sure that we do that because that window will close out at midnight uh, and then you won't have an opportunity. Uh, you received instructions on how to do so uh, via the email that delivered this YouTube lecture link. So uh, take a look at that. Um, also, and I'm sure this will come as a point of celebration. Uh, we won't have a lecture for next class, Thursday, November 12th. I'll cover that at the end of the lecture. Uh, we'll instead uh, reconvene on November 17th by receiving a lecture on uh, the Best New Poets 2019 collection. So you should have read that anthology by then. It's around 100 pages in length. So it's not that long, especially with regard to anthologies, right? Uh, as you read it though, start to think about how these various poems compare, perhaps even fall into a tradition of uh, the past texts we covered, uh, specifically Charles Wright's Black Zodiac and Matt Rasmussen's Black Aperture, those collections. Oh, and one final note, uh, I use this lecture for a prior class, uh, so please ignore any references to prior dates that I may make. Okay, let's take a look at Brian Turner's collection of war poetry, Here, Bullet. Okay, so let's take a look at this poem. Uh, he uses a number of techniques Turner does uh, within this poem that I believe uh, closely adhere to what we cover in postmodernism, the elements of postmodernity, right? So first off, this is sort of wonky, but the book, this is an ebook, like I think that some of you have already uh, purchased, I think it was, it was like 10 or $11. Uh, my book's in my office in uh, Medicine Hat. Uh, so I purchased it through, uh, through, through Kindle. Uh, what should be first, what should be first is on the right-hand side where it says uh, that we have a short epigraph from the Quran. Uh, who brings forth the living from the dead and the dead from the living, all right? So Brian Turner's attempting to make some commentary on war uh, through the idea of death, right? And living, the tension and conflict that exists between the two things, the binary of those two things, right? They oppose each other, death and, and, uh, and life. Uh, so he's saying something. And that's, the epigraph is sort of a postmodern technique, barring from some artifact from the past. In this case, it's the Quran. And then, then we jump into the actual poem, poem poems of the collection. Uh, we begin with the first poem, A Soldier's Arabic. Notice here, too, that because I screenshotted these, that um, the title of it is 
underlined and it shouldn't be, but just to let you know that's not how you would um, write uh, a title if you're accessing one within your own essays. It would just be with quotation marks around it, no underlining. A soldier's Arabic, and then we get another epigraph. And Brian Turner does this throughout the collection. We see lots of epigraphs that he, he – they're sort of a jumping off point right? Uh, into the poem itself. It sets up sort of what the poem is going to be about and uh, accesses something from the past always. This is, it's a quote from somebody right? without quotation marks, but we know it's by Ernest Hemingway. There is a strange new kind of war where you learn just as much as you are able to believe. So the idea of – you're, you're going into this new landscape, this new place geographically, um, different language, different culture, right? Do you ever go to war with the same people? Well, in civil wars you do, I guess, but you're out, most typically you're fighting someone else who is other, other culture, other language. Um, and then you're learning all these things uh, in this new landscape, in this sweeping new landscape, I think Ernest Hemingway is saying here, stay, saying here. And you're learning just as much as you're able to believe, right? These These, these – stark new images and experiences are uh, surreal and almost unbelievable. So all that meaning Brian Turner is attempting to infuse in his own poetry by borrowing from an artifact from the past, which is Ernest Hemingway's quote that he's using as an epigraph here. So, right? so that artifact from the past, that postmodern element right, that he's borrowing to give this, this poem meaning. So let's go ahead and read the poem. The word for love, Habib, is written from right to left, starting where we would end it and ending where we might begin. Where we would end a war, another might take as a beginning, or as an echo of history recited again. Speak the word for death, mot, and you will hear the cursives of the wind driven into the veil of the unknown. This is a language made of blood. It is made of sand and time. To be spoken, it must be earned. Okay, great. Number of things going on here. Uh, that are postmodern. So Calc, remember we spoke about the idea of utilizing foreign language and or translations. And he is, Turner certainly is here, Habib is, is love, uh, and then Malt is death. So these, these Arabic words uh, that he's infusing uh, within his own work. And of course we get the epigraphs, Ernest Hemingway, very known uh, individual who wrote novels about war, uh, served as a medic in the First World War. Uh, so we get that sort of artifact from the past as well. That's doing a great service for Turner's work. And then the religious artifacts, such as the Quran. Any text is an artifact from the past, right? Using it to thrust forward meaning, whatever that meaning is from, from, uh, from the Quran. So as to what service these elements are doing for the poetry, one reason goes back to the type of poetry Turner is writing. What is called poetry of witness is what he's doing here. Throughout history, some poets have felt a moral or ethical imperative to bear witness to their poetry, uh, in their poetry, to events such as war, genocide, racism, corporate greed, dictatorial tyranny, and other acts of injustice. So think about the poet in this instance being an eyewitness to events that bear memorializing. Turner, uh, as the poet of witness, is blending all those postmodern elements in order to immerse the reader into that world he witnessed, to make it come alive through all the artifacts of the past. Poetry of witness, too, captures the concepts slash actions of the individual. Something I address at the end of this lecture, especially re remarking on postmodern's will to destroy grand or meta narratives, but we're talking about more later. Another passage uh, I like to outline uh, to a greater degree of what exactly the poetry of witness does uh, is within a book uh, I've had for years called Poets Companion. So I'll go ahead and read a short passage. Uh, how they define poetry of witness and, or, and give us a sense of, of what it is. In a sense, all poems are poems of witness. They record what it's like to, to be alive, set down what is passing and irrevocable. They say this happened, or this is what it felt like, or this is who I am, who she was, what they stood for. And also, of course, this is what never happened according to a person who will never exist. Those poems bear witness to the imagination, to the endless human capacity for creative invention. Okay, this happened. War happens. Brian Turner, through being a soldier, was also a distant cor correspondent for us, right? A news correspondent, capturing the images through poetry, infusing them uh, with simile and metaphor so we have greater beauty and understanding and more persuasive in nature in that way. Let's take a look at another poem. Brian Turner's poetry reminds me of a number of um, individuals who were famous war poets. 
uh, and fall into the, what we might put as a subgenre of war poetry itself, calling it that, right? Uh, so Rainer Jarrell, very famous, giant collection of poetry um, he uh, collected. Um, and he was a, a, a war correspondent uh, in World War I and II, so he saw a lot of stuff. Uh, and he, he tried to capture it as best as he could in his poetry. And uh, some of the images, some of the way that Brian Turner writes and casts the image, uh, the macabre and stark images of war, uh, reminds me a lot of Jarrell. And surely, and Brian Turner, he's an educator now. He teaches at college, university, and in in, in, teaches in the MF, MFA program of teaching other individuals how to write uh, poetry. Uh, he would have been a highly cognizant of Jarrell's work and would have borrowed his, his style. Um, so let's go ahead and read it. Protocols, Randall Jarrell, uh, Burknow, Odessa, the children speak alternately. So we get this parenthetical title. You get the title, Protocols, uh, and then you get the, the parenthetical title, all to infuse meaning. So notice we're going to get two voices. In, in the parenthetical title, they tell us that, the children speak it alternately. Uh, we went there on the train. They had big barges that they towed. We stood up. There were so many, I was squashed. There was a smokestack. Then they made me wash. It was a factory, I think. My mother held me up, and I could see the ship that made the smoke. When I was tired, my mother carried me. She said, don't be afraid. But I was only tired. Where we went, there was no more Odessa. They had water in a pipe, like rain, but hot. The water there is deeper than the rolled. And I was tired and fell in my sleep. And the water drank me. That is what I think. And I said to my mother, now I'm washed and dried. My mother hugged me and it smelled like hay. And that is how you die. And that is how you die. So some beautiful things going on here. Some sort of macabre and categorized and maybe even ugly situation that they're in. These 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 characters, the, both the two narrators, we got two speakers or two narrators uh, within this poem, the, these two children. So some astonishing, uh, astonishingly ugly, but also beautiful moments in this poem. The story of the poem is this. Two children on a train ride, each speaking on their own, parallel events, because they're, they're experiencing similar events. Uh, to include a factory, a place we can presume is a concentration camp where all the characters of this poem will eventually die due to the systematic gassing um, within these death camps, uh, shower rooms, uh, which were converted to deliver gas instead of water. Jarrell is, after all, a poet of World War II and a witness of those horrendous events from that era. So he is in the tradition of, of Turner, or Turner is in, sorry, is in the tradition of Jarrell being a poet of witness, going away somewhere, in this case war, seeing the stark, astonishing, macabre, ugly scenes of war, documenting it and bringing it back for the rest of us to somehow uh, digest. Let's look back at the poetic elements uh, of this work. The narration is, as the parenthetical title suggests, alternating between two narrators, in this case, two young children. Joel is showing us they are children in a number of ways. First, we get the parenthetical title. He's telling us the children speak it alternately. The use of the language seeming to come from a child, words like, also tells us that, that they're children, big barges, very simply, simply cast of explanation of what this lo looks like. I was squashed, so the language um, that he chose. Um, some of the events of the poem point towards the narrator being young children, such as the indecision of whether it was a factory. Um, it was a factory, I think, right? So the, the child would like, not lack the sort of knowledge or the grand world and the vocabulary to, to cast what the things, things are in the world in a definitive sort of way. My mother picked me up because the narrator's child size, right? And even the dialogue of the poem points towards the narrator's age. Now I'm washed and dried like a child uh, just came from a bath to let his mom know he's ready for bed. One, it's, but that's both beautiful and, oh gosh, horrific in some ways, right? Now I am washed and dried. One of the beautiful moments of the poem comes by way of the imagery and simile in, in the last stanza. And the water drank me, and my mother hugged me, and it smelled like hay. Such a strange and haunting image to think of water drinking you. It's so creative and different. Water drinking you, as opposed to the opposite, what we're so used to, you drinking the water. What is the water drinking him? You're drinking the two speakers of the poem. Um, probably the gas pouring over them. And what a palpable odor of a mother smelling like hay, presumably the makeshift bedding of a train car still uh, permeating throughout her clothing. 
So following some of the same tr uh, traditions that we're establishing as uh, poetry of witness, Joel is, uh, as well as Turner. So the title poem, many uh, collections of poetry uh, are anchored uh, by a poem with the same title, mirroring the very same title of the collection itself. And we get that here. The book of, the, of poetry is called Here Bullet. And within the book of poetry, we get the title poem uh, Here Bullet. Let's go ahead and read it. If a body is what you want, then here is bone and gristle and flesh. Here is the clavicle snapped fish wish. The aorta's open valves, the leap thought makes as a synaptic gap. Here is the adrenaline rush you crave, that inexorable flight, that insane puncture into heat and blood. And I dare you to finish what you've started. Because here, bullet, here is where I complete the world you bring, the word, sorry, the word you bring hissing through the air. Here is where I moan, the barrel's cold esophagus triggering my tongue's explosives for the rifling I have inside of me. Each twist of the round spun deeper, because here, bullet, here is where the world ends every time. All right, powerful stuff going on in, in, uh, within this poem. So some torque language of the poem, clavicle snapped, uh, wish is great, could have easily said, um, Turner could have said uh, shoulder bone. But he's given us some sound here, and he's given us some imagery, clavicle snapped, right? That's snapped. Um, sonically engaging, but this torque language is more sonically engaging and more precise using uh, the clavicle instead of shoulder. Uh, the inexorable flight, uh, that insane puncture, and then the speaker uh, narrator directly challenges this uh, inanimate object, this bullet, uh, where Turner's actually making the bullet a person by anthropomorphizing it. That is, giving it human characteristics and taunting it. Here, bullet, I dare you. Other torque, sonically engaging uh, language and evocative imagery is starts, you can see, let's start down, halfway down uh, the uh, poem. Because here, bullet, here's where I complete the word you bring hissing through the air. Here's where I moan, the barrel's cold esophagus. It's beautiful language, beautiful imagery. The barrel's cold esophagus, to think of the barrel, uh, to have this pipe within it. It is this pipe, right? Triggering my tongue's explosives for the rifling I have inside of me. Each twist of the round spun deeper because here, bullet, here's where the world ends every time. So, almost as if the soldier, um, as we know Brian Turner to have been in a time of war, and the speaker as well, they're very sort of married up in that way. Uh, I know we attempt to say that the speaker is not necessarily the writer or the author, uh, but we know they're close here. Um, there's a certain anxiety that comes with being at war. I was deployed to Iraq at the same time uh, as Brian Turner in 2003 uh, as part of the Marine Corps. And you get over the fact of being shot at. Um, at some point, you have to. Uh, and either you, you enter some level of anxiety or you want to fight back against those bullets, which is certainly what he's doing here, giving it pushback by making it sort of this living thing and then saying, here, bullet, if you want this, you come and get it, right? So some interesting things going on in this poetry. All right. Uh, next poem by Brian Turner within the collection. Uh, here, bullet. Body bags. Interesting uh, title. Uh, already has its own built-in image that's attempting to communicate something to us along the lines of death, most likely. Or the actual idea of begging for something. Let's go ahead and read it. A murder of crows looks on in silence from the eucalyptus trees above. As we stand over the bodies who look as if they might roll over, wake from a dream and question us about the blood drying on their scalps, the bullets lodged in the back of their skulls, to ask where their wives and children are this morning and why this hovering of flies, the taste of flatbread and chai, gone from their mouths as they stretch and rise, wondering who these strangers are, who would kick their hard feet saying, last call, motherfucker, last call. All right, sorry for the graphic language. Uh, so. <laughs> powerful, powerful uh, poem, both in this language and what is attempting to sort of show us, right, as a poet, a poet of witness, as he has witnessed this sort of, you know, uh, scene. Uh, so let's look at some of the language uh, Turner is intentionally infusing in order to create an, an effect of death. We get what a grouping of crows are called in real life, a murder of crows, right? Uh, so that idea of death, bodies, you know, you think of bodies, you think of death. Uh, the title of it, body bags, death, blood death scalps do we ever get the word scalp 
uh, unless you're talking about someone getting their getting scalped, you know, or you're having some sort of problem with your own scalp, right? So that's death. The idea means scalped. Bullets lodged and skulls, of course, that's death. We get morning as in dawn, right? The idea of it being morning time or dawn, uh, but certainly alludes to morning as a homophone of morning, right? Morning is in morning one's death, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, is a homophone of M-O-R-N-I-N-G. They sound the same, but have separate definitions. And finally, last call at the end of the poem, something you would hear in a bar, um, but in this case refers back to their last call of life. Last call, mother effers, last call. Interesting here, too, is the idea of the murderer crows looking on as if they are the poet of witness. I think he does this in a number of poems. Uh, we're going to look at one in a moment, but he allows something else to be the witness. And the, the poet is allowing here a murder of crows, crows look on in silence. They're looking at this scene unfold, right? Almost as a fly on the wall. In this case, a murder of crows uh, perched in a eucalyptus tree. Okay, here we go, as promised, another connection um, as we had in the prior poem, Body Bags. Turner does something similar here, uh, as he did in Body Bags, uh, whereby we get the imagery of birds who are almost the onlookers, the witness of war, uh, the observers, as we see reflected in the poem's title, even, Observation Post number 71. Notice, too, the tension that exists between uh, the beauty of the first and, and beginning of the second stanza and how that contrasts to milk cows bellowing in a field of trash. So the first stanza, owls rest in the vines of wild grapes, eucalyptus trees shimmer, and from the minaret a voice. Each, like, uh, each life has its moment. The sunflowers lift their faces toward dawn, and then we get a contrast with as milk cows bellow in a field of trash. Turner seems throughout these poems um, to somehow temper or balance out the pristine with the ugly or coarse image, which is ultimately a technique to reveal the harsh reality of war. It is both great because you're enacting your nation's policy in order to affect honorable change in this world by going to war, and it's deplorable wars because there will ultimately be death. It seems that Brian Turner is observing here. Okay, another uh, Randall Jarrell uh, poem, a famous, another famous poem uh, by Randall Jarrell, uh, death, uh, highly anthologized, the death of a ball turret gunner. The death of the ball turret gunner. From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state, and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze, six miles from earth, loosed from its dream of life. I woke to black flack in the nightmare fighters, when I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. Wow. Some interesting things going on here in this very small space. Uh, five lines. Uh, like the strong narrative voice and stark imagery within body bags and many poems throughout uh, Here Bullet. Here Bullet. Jarrell is accessing two stark images in order to demonstrate for the reader the callousness of war, to show through its violence how exactly it affects the human condition, that is war. All things the poem of witness must do to preserve some action from the past by memorializing it into print. Not memorializing it in a way that is celebrated, but in a way that states, this happened, I saw it, I can't unsee it. So here you go, now you see it too. And surely uh, Jarrell had done this as a predecessor to Turner, and as Turner is doing this as a tradition of the poetry of witness. So we get the beginning and the, the opening lines, from my mother's sleep, I fell into the state. So let's just sort of define, in case we don't know, what a ball turret is. Ball turret gunner uh, is an extension of that. So the bombers uh, of World War II uh, had to have defense. Uh, so they had guns. Uh, positioned uh, on their wings and pointing forward, but they also had under the belly uh, of the bomber uh, a, a round swiveling turret, right? It could swivel, it had two, uh, it was a double barrel uh, gun, machine gun, and their sole job was to cover the flank uh, and, the, and the, the, uh, the sides as well, but where the fire planes would come up and attempt to destroy the bombers before they were able to deliver their precious package to whatever target they had. And uh, often they were highly exposed, the ball turret gunners were, because they had no defense other than themselves. And when they were uh, out of bullets or ammunition or they were in the midst of reloading, they were highly susceptible to being shot and killed. Uh, if you ever saw the movie, um, God, is Memphis Bell, um, they sort of address the idea of ball turret gunners uh, within it. So it was very cold. 
they had to wear the, remember the, those flight jackets from World War II, made of leather, brown leather, with a big giant uh, sort of um, boa of fur at the top and on, through your sleeves, fur and wool, highly up above the earth, loosed from its dream of life. I woke to black flack in the nightmare of fighters, so they shot and killed him. When I died, interestingly enough, this voice from the past, right? When I died, this person is a witness of their own death. When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose, right? So this callous act of, you know, well, yes, he died. Maybe we're sorry for that. Maybe we're not. We got to get him out of there, clean it up, put another ball turret in and get ball turret gunner in and get back to work, right? Because the war is not going to stop because of one person's death. Okay, only a couple more slides left, and I couldn't get out of here, uh, this lecture, without bringing one of my own uh, poetry of witness to the table, right? So I deployed to Iraq, uh, 2003, 2004, um, in the Marine Corps. <clears throat> so uh, I was able to come back, um, go through an MFA program, bring some of my experiences that I remember, that I recall, and cast them within the realm of poetry of witness. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and read this, and then we'll speak about uh, the elements of poetry within it. The Behavior of Wild Birds. A lurch of smoke spills into mid-march. The wild birds of Baghdad punch their wings in and out. The dark bellow underneath stinking of sulfur and scat as the flo flocks part in mid-flight. I wake to the cry of birdsong and the sound of titanium blades thrumming against thick air, revealing a slit of bleached sky. And above, the swill of the cormorants, black and black-gray, clip across the badger outline of a city as if to map its decay or temporary triumph. Tonight, snake birds, heads furled in midair, call out with a shriek, as if to know the churn of smoke will soon bombard with the flash of spring rain. Outside the mosques, I could almost hold something in my hand, that thing that defines itself through prayer song, those foreign notes flapping within, the corridors of burnt buildings, Ring out as the music drifts above the stems of date palms, startling a lone ingrate as thin as a wire, stalled in the happenstance of standing street water, probing for fish or some thing not of clay, not of sand, not of mud. In the distance there is the hammer cop, bill clattering back and forth with another, like old generals disputing the shifting of wind or the ratio of sand to sanded air. In the distance, all is cooing, as if to settle in or to settle an ancient quarrel, the rotor hum of the offspray, the magnitude of it lowering itself to the earth, the size of its belly as its offspring huddle like soft-shelled eggs, hardening themselves from within. Okay. A lot going on in this poem as well. Uh, I couldn't put it all uh, on the PowerPoint. It's just it was too long the way I, I did the stanzas. Uh, very short, st very short lines and short stanzas. Uh, so it would just take up to a space and it was just easier to read uh, aloud. So with specific regard to the elements of poetry, uh, think about imagery within this poem. Most notably, the use and re of and reoccurring use of bird imagery. The reoccurring images of birds grounds the reader in this moment. We could see those birds. And the side of them can be extrapolated to mean many different things. What did birds stand for, right? What was I attempting to infuse, intentional or otherwise, within this poem? Freedom? I don't know. Um, I know I was attempting to pull in the reader by actually offering them images of this land, this landscape, this country, their culture. But they're also nonetheless vivid in their appearance within the poem, these birds. It is also uh, set up, it's also here, the birds or to set up the final stanza, the end effect we spoke about, how the poet leaves us with a certain tone, uh, how the poet leaves us with a certain ambiguity as to what happens next, uh, or a certain emotion. Uh, within this poem, at the end, uh, I use, I set up throughout the poem the idea of birds as a reoccurring theme, these images, right? And then at the end, I use the rotor hum of the offspray. You know, maybe someone has to do some homework with that, uh, look at what an offspray is, but it's bird, first and foremost, that could take up out of water vertically, uh, and so is offspray, uh, a vehicle um, within the Marine Corps uh, where they deliver troops. Um, so it could, it's a helicopter and it's a plane all at once, right? It can vertically take off and then turn into a, a, uh, an airplane uh, to fly longer distances with its cargo, usually human cargo. So I use that, the double imagery of that, the idea, the double meaning of that, the entendre. Uh, and then the idea of the individuals within it, uh, its offspring huddle like soft-shelled eggs who are, you know, 
they're new, they're soft, but soon they're going to be hardened uh, from within. So a lot of different things going on, a lot of ways to, to move within the tradition of war poetry, the subgenre of war poetry, a lot of ways to sort of uh, use poetry or witness to affect and even enact uh, change. All right, uh, two more poems that we're going to look at today. Um, first one, or of the two poems, last poems we're going to look at, two stories down. So let's, I'm going to go ahead and read this aloud. When he jumped from the balcony, Hassan swam in the air over the Ashur street market, arms and legs suspended in a blur, above palm hearts and crates of lemons, not realizing just how hard life fights sometimes, how an American soldier would run to his aid there on the sidewalk, trying to make sense of Hussein's broken legs, his screaming, trying to comfort him with words and an awkward music of stress and care. A soldier he'd startle by stealing the knife from its sheath, the two of them struggling for the blade until the blood groove sunk deep, and Hassan whispered to him, Shukran, Sadiq, Shukran. Thank you, friend. Thank you. All right. So what is the actual uh, story of this poem? What's going on? Uh, so it's pretty on the surface and plain, plainly sort of delivered to us, communicated to us. He's not trying to cloak it, uh, really, with poetic language or any other sort of way of doing that. Uh, so we get the title. Then we get uh, when he jumped from the balcony, Hassan. So we have this man that jumped out of a balcony. Um, we don't know why necessarily. He's hovering in the air, uh, Turner or the narrator or th those two things infused as one are a witness to this happening. The guy hits the sidewalk, the Iraqi guy. Um, again, we have no idea if he was thrown out of the window or if he jumped out of the window. Uh, the soldier goes to his aid. Uh, Hassan pulls the knife, the bayonet probably, or K-bar, which is uh, the knife that the Marine Corps uh, Marines get issued. K bar, uh, and the guy kills himself. The Iraqi guy kills himself to the soldier's astonishment. So that's the story. Uh, some strong imagery in this poem, too. Swam uh, in the air is beautiful. The idea of recasting that image as something new. He could have just said, you know, floating in the air or arms. Could have just totally omitted that, right? But it wouldn't have been as strong. Uh, how Hassan swam in the air over the Ashore Street Market is something that you could see almost in a movie of slow motion as a person's falling. Here again, there uh, there is the integration of foreign language in the last two lines of the poem. We get the shakra, sadiq, shakran, uh, thank you, friend, thank you. This that postmodern technique of calc, which here enables us to hear firsthand the language of this land's inhabitants, ultimately immersing us deeper uh, into this poignant, sad, and even macabre moment of this guy's death. The poet's duty, especially as a poet of witness, is to record all details, never shying away from the truth in all its raw and unfettered ugliness. In this case, what is presumably either a homicide or a suicide attempt when he jumps out the window, uh, then an eventual suicide, a self-stabbing um, at the end of it. Uh, notice, too, I just want to reference real quick the, the last poem uh, that we spoke about, uh, two stories, uh, the double meaning of two stories. All right, you get two stories with the, its literal meaning of the size of the building, this individual falling two stories, right, down to his, to its, uh, to his injuries and then his eventual death by stabbing. Uh, and then the two stories, the, the Iraqi, the Iraq's man story, as well as uh, the narrator of the story, the soldier, and how their two stories are intersecting. I just wanted to touch on that before I move on. All right, so... Here we get the last poem uh, that I'm going to look at today uh, is eulogy. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and read it, then we're going to talk about it. It happens on Monday at 11.20 a.m. as tower guards eat sandwiches and seagulls drift by on the Tigris River. Pri prisoners tilt their heads to the west, though burlap, sa through burlap, though burlap sacks and duct tape blind them. The sound reverberates down concertina coils, the way piano wire thrums when given slack. And it happens like this. On a blue day of sun, when Private Miller pulls the trigger to take brass and fire into his mouth, the sound lifts the birds up off the water. A mongoose pauses under the orange trees, and nothing can stop it now, no matter what. Blur of motion surrounds him, no matter what voices crackle over the radio in static confusion. Because if only for this moment the earth is stilled, and Private Miller has found what low, that, sorry, what low hush there is down in the eucalyptus shade, there by the river and then we get the sort of uh, 
mentioning a PS, PFC, uh, B. Miller, and his birth and his, on his death. So PFC stands for Private First Class. Uh, it's one of the lowest ranks. Private being the lowest rank, it being you, you uh, get promoted to Private First Class from Private. So one aspect of postmodern literature, if you recall, is slightly touching on at the beginning of this lecture, is the idea of obliterating grand or meta narratives, but instead focusing on uh, the individual's plight. In the death of a ball turret gunner, Jarrell, uh, coming out of the modernist literary style, doesn't give the ball turret gunner a name and certainly doesn't commemorate his death, but treats it as, as just another common person dying. Even the title, Death of the Ball turret Gunner, not Death of a Ball turret Gunner, as if to allude to the reader that this is just a common act of war. And in his death, another ball turret gunner uh, waits in the wings to take his place. Turner, however, is in a way, and as the title of the poem underscores, eulogizing PFC uh, Miller, giving us the grisly details uh, of all that is going on in both the poem's backdrop, but also to a dying soldier who takes his own life. Uh, this eulogy is seen not only in the title, which is titled eulogy, uh, but also the date stamp of his death in the lower right-hand side of this poem, almost as if there is a lone uh, gravestone. Remember, too, in terms of what you can write about uh, for our short essays in the future, especially with regard to Here Bullet, comparing other war poetry to Turner's. You can do that, comparative literature. How they are similar or dissimilar would be one way you could sort of do that. Uh, it's perfectly permissible to do that. If you wanted to compare, like I did here, go, you can either do bring nuance to what I spoke about with Jarrell versus Turner um, versus other war poets and, um, from the past, uh, or you could take uh, other avenues uh, with regard to this with regard to your upcoming essays. Okay, guys? So let me flip to the last uh, last slide and, and then we'll be done. Questions. As always, please email me if you have any questions or concerns or points of clarification that you require. Uh, so quick reminder, your short essay, as I stated at the beginning of this lecture, uh, your short essay number three um, is due um, via Blackboard by midnight tonight. Uh, and the instructions would have been emailed to you uh, with this YouTube lecture link. Uh, so please look out for that uh, next week, uh, next class. Uh, we don't have a class, so that's November 12th, Thursday. Uh, later on this week, uh, we're off, uh, so be aware of that. Uh, and then we're reconvening, of course, uh, with a lecture uh, on November 17th, which is Tuesday, and then we'll be able to review uh, Best New Poets uh, 2019. So please have that read by then. Uh, I look forward to seeing you guys or lecturing to you guys next class. Have a good break. Uh, and please email me and reach out to me if you have any questions. Thanks a lot. Talk to you guys later. Bye.